Hello and welcome to the Stories of Northern Life from the Sault Ste. Marie Museum. This is a historical recording of R.W. Knight as he talks about the building of the International Bridge. Keep in mind that this is a recording from 1971. We have done our best to restore the audio to the highest quality, but in some parts it may be harder to understand than others. Also keep in mind that some language used may not be appropriate in today's world. I hope you learned something you didn't know about the building of the International Bridge. Historical Society meeting Thursday, November the 18th, 1971. Mr. Ronald E. Knight speaking on the building of the International Bridge. Preliminary words are greatly indebted to the museum itself and to Colonel Hamilton for the source of a great deal of the material I had to use tonight. And because of the shortness of time, Mr. McNamara referred to this, uh, my wife helped fill the breach by doing some research on bridges in general. And to both of these parties, I'm indebted. Incidentally, the scrapbook of Colonel Hamilton, I understand, is presented eventually to the city of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, Mr. Knight, can I give you the particulars of that? Yes. It has been presented to the oh, city I see. And we are deported. And uh, as the situation in the city hall is far from static, we have been asked to keep it until such time as they have a place. Thank you very much. Now, insofar as bridges are concerned, I could go back far into history and talk about their construction, the various developments that have occurred over the years. Our continent in particular is probably the best endowed with natural bridges of any other part of the world. We have the natural bridges up in Arizona, Petrified Ridge, the arches of Bryce Canyon in Utah, the bridge over Cedar Creek in Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, and the Aborigines on this continent, this far north at least, usually just spread a log over the creek to get to one from one place to another. But bridges have been referred to as points of passage, and they have a connecting link in a way because people passing from one side to the other can meet and shake hands. So they help cement, they help, help tie together different communities. And this was certainly the case in Sault Ste. Marie. I would only, uh, I would really like to have been of the vintage of Colonel um, Hamilton. And no doubt, because he has mentioned some in dispatches and letters, the early part of the history. I would like to have been around when he was a boy and probably shared his dreams with others of his vintage. Uh, the first letter in the scrapbook of note is one addressed to him when he was a member of the House of Commons in Ottawa. It has to do with the interest in bridge building at that time. This was 1937. And the Niagara Falls Bridge, now replaced by the rainbow, had been destroyed in the ice jam. And they were making plans for a rebuilding. And that was the item in those years. Um, as a result of the interest of Colonel Hamilton and others at the time, um, there was a meeting held in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario of an international nature, uh, and then they were going to strike while the iron was hot, thinking in terms of having the bridge completed across the St. Mary's by 1941. Of course, there was a hiatus as a result of the war. And we take up the story again in 
1953. In that year, under Governor Man Williams, there was a strong movement in the state of Michigan to bridge the St. Mary. And it was at this time that Colonel Hamilton was appointed as a consultant uh, to the International Michigan Bridge uh, Authority. Also, at this time, again, there were local meetings. The then mayor, I believe it was Mr. Snail at that time, and uh, the city solicitor, Arthur Wishart, they uh, attended on the legislature in Toronto, uh, which was about 50, 55 legislature in Toronto, and the Commons in Ottawa, uh, pressing for uh, a bridge across the St. Mary's. Now there are very many, there are many problems in connection. Three levels of government on each side of the river were concerned. There was, of course, the transit company operating a ferry here. They, in some way, would have to be compensated if the bridge offered competition. There is one statement that was made in the Star, Sioux Star editorial, January 11, 1961, while the actual bridge was under construction. And it said something to this effect that progress is a wonderful thing, but progress does hurt people. Someone must suffer. This is a rather philosophical way of looking at it, because it is certainly true whenever mankind has made progress. People of a conservative bent, people with interest to lose, do suffer. But I think in the long run, uh, the, the progress uh, cannot be held back. And it was so in this case. Uh, as we go through the scrapbook, we see <coughs> the number of interests that were hurt uh, to help out the wider interest. International cooperation, uh, the traffic problem in Sault Ste. Marie, and on, in both cities, was uh, a difficult matter in those summers without the bridge as the vehicular traffic on the roads increased. But concomitant forces were at work here because it was hoped that a dual highway extending up into the northern peninsula, because the Michigan area that's been the hub of the Great Lakes uh, contains somewhere between 15 and 16 of the population did at that time. These people on the move, Michigan is a mobile state. Uh, they would want to come over into Canada. Also at the same time, uh, this was thought to be a link in the uh, Trans-Canada system. They were looking forward to completion of a, a circular route around Lake Superior. This was not at that time in the early 50s a reality. So it was a, a good time to think in terms of this westward link. A good time to think in terms of uh, bringing um, an influx of tourists into the northern part of Ontario. Now, the election of 1957, uh, 1957 uh, in Ontario uh, enabled the then Premier Frost to make political capital of this region. He was returned to office on June 11th of that year, and the Thomas, as far as he was concerned, as far as the people of this area were concerned, was that a bridge would be built. A visit to Blind River and to the Sioux, he talked to his aim. A year later, having got into office, uh, the soundings had been taken, many steps in the 
preparations for the bridge have been taken. Expenses had already been incurred, and the uh, province itself threatened to cut off uh, their contribution to the program if a site already uh, analyzed, a site already decided upon, were not approved by the council. Almost unanimously, with one exception, the Sault Ste. Marie Council all through and approved of this site. <coughs> A site in the west end of the city uh, for the Canadian approach uh, in the Hudson Street, Queen Albert area. Now, there had been pressure groups at work on both sides of the river against this full site, particularly the people of Sugar Island. Uh, it was not in a, it was not a matter of uh, location so much because uh, a crossing at Sugar Island would have been feasible, uh, even though the uh, solid rock that one finds, the sandstone that one finds up around Whitefish Island was not present there, a crossing over Sugar Island would have been feasible, but the expenses would have increased. Uh, there was a strong pressure at that time to uh, construct a tunnel, but the maintenance costs in that relation would have been expensive. A check that I believe was made with Detroit on this matter and uh, with Sarnia. Sarnia, they have the uh, railroad tunnel under the river. Uh, these pictures that uh, uh, the museum, Mr. Durham, I think it was Colonel Hamilton Hamil presented those also. Thank you. Um, our enlargements of the dedication ceremony, which took place in May 24th of 1963, Governor Romney and other officials and attendees. 63, you're putting oh, this. Uh, yes, this is the dedica yes, dedication ceremony. Now, the links with Sarnia, uh, between Sarnia and the Sioux, seem always to be cropping up. There was a mention by Mrs. Durham Knight in the minutes of the meeting. And going back to 1937, Colonel Hamilton at that time was in close cooperation with Mr. Gray, who was then the sitting member of the federal parliament for West Lampton. Uh, as, you, as you know, the uh, uh, Lampton people had just completed their rainbow bridge at that time, or was it under construction at that time? I don't remember when it was completed, but in the late 30s. And of course, he too was interested in this uh, river, river crossing. So there was a strong reliance upon that part of the world. This, of course, at that time was the, would be the only crossing of the uh, international boundary north of Fort Sherry uh, by the Hector Bridge. Um, the Pigeon River, the Hector Bridge has not yet, has not then been completed. We're still waiting for the uh, circular road around Lake Superior. Insofar as the bridge construction itself is concerned, it was rather simplified in Sault Ste. Marie because we have here simply a beam with arches going back to a very primitive method of construction. One could simply, um, here we have the old beam construction, the bridge on, on piers, and of course the arch would be added. And the Sault Ste. Marie Bridge is a series of arches 430 footers, one on the Canadian side and two on the United States side. And the financing uh, raised problems. Financing and revenues. It was hoped by Premier Frost back in Fifth Heaven that three years after completion of the bridge, we would see it paid for. 
I think this was an idle dream at the time. Private financing on the Michigan side worked very well. Of the bonds that were issued, Canadian government or the Ontario government subscribed about $750,000 worth. This was still short of the cost of the Canadian approaches. Of course, on the Michigan side, uh, Michigan itself very early uh, completed its approach, but they were underwritten by the federal government to the tune of about 90%. Fortunately, these B bonds on the Ontario side, they were having trouble a couple of years ago when the bridge crossing toll was increased, paying off their bondholders. Now, when we go back to medieval period in Europe, uh, there are bridges. One of them in France has a dedicatory plaque attached, uh, which says that uh, passage over a bridge should not be should be toll free. That to them, the building of a bridge was really a Christian act. That uh, really uh, the building of a bridge was God's work, permitting people to move across natural barriers. Uh, I think we all look forward on both sides of the river to the day when. We are in the position that people say in Buckle and Fort Erie, or in Fort Churn and Simon, where the crossing is down to a token sum. Now, regarding the Fort Erie Bridge, uh, the Peace Bridge has long been paid for, and it's really a matter of maintenance now. But a rather ticklish legal point came up regarding that. Uh, Fort Erie Bridge back in uh, 57, I guess it was. New York State had passed legislation with a view to improving Buffalo Harbor and the airport at Buffalo. And uh, for some reason or another, they had included in this legislation a uh, reference to the Canadian side of the Peace Bridge and approaches to the Peace Bridge at Fort Erie. It's strange that this uh, problem should have arisen just about the time that Sault Ste. Marie was interested in its bridge. But nevertheless, uh, this is a ticklish legal problem because it would have to be worked out first of all before legislation by any uh, level of government. The cessation of the ferry uh, which we enjoyed here before the bridge. Yes, of course, I've already spoken about the problem of traffic. The uh, city itself had gone to the extent of leasing a lot in the downtown area to accommodate cars who were waiting passage on the ferry. And the uh, ferry people, of course, the Eastern Company, uh, were uh, opposed to, to the bridge. Naturally, the competition, Simon had been through the same problem. The uh, down on Christina Street, sorry, the merchants um, had been opposed to the bridge here, unless the bridge crossed the river at uh, the old ferry site. What I'm looking for is a newspaper clipping in the scrapbook. I have one here, uh, Tuesday, April 5th, 1960. The Ontario Legislature mm -hmm. Lodge and uh, uh, Bills Committee was told Monday that the terms under which the Sioux Ferry system uh, will be bought are favorable to the problem. J.D. Arnup, an official in the Treasury Department, declared that Ontario should show a profit on the ferry operations before completion of the Sioux International Bridge. Once the bridge is finished, the ferries will go out of business. This is one of the terms of financing the bridge. Mr. Arnup quoted figures on the International Transit Company the owner of the ferries, after CCF leader Donald McDonald had questioned the necessity of the province buying the ferry system. Provincial Treasurer Allen Durant pointed out that the International Transit Company franchise was from the federal government and that there was every reason to suppose that it could be renewed. Mm -hmm. You see that the Department of Transport 
uh, and other uh, government agencies were involved in this bridge building. So it was a complicated business, uh, not only because it was an international venture. In addition, federal legislation setting up St. Mary's River Bridge Company specifically forbids exploration of the ferries. Mr. Arnott said that the province not only expects to get back its investment in buying the ferries by operating them for three seasons, but it even hopes there will be a profit. In other words, the government had bought the transit company and were then attempting to operate the ferry system. Of course, the bridge costs were going up all the time. Had they built it in 1937 or 38 or 39, for completion in 1941, they could have done it at the cost of about $2 million. As it was, it cost over $20 million. Then there's a there's one piece here before I do it that is rather interesting. You know, what I said about making political capital says here, bridge due to cost effort. And of course, the uh, United States Corps of Engineers, they were opposed to the bridge site for various reasons. They said it could cause, uh, besides security, they said it could cause damage to ships, smoke danger uh, to traffic, interference with the uh, uh, movement of traffic in the smoke, possibility of travel fire on the ship, interference with the, with the blasting operations, uh, and taking the solid and putting the piers, 62 piers have to go in. This would interfere with the, the dredging and the deepening of the channel, the level of the water, and so on. All sorts of arguments against it. That would explain why they had the screen on the American side. Yeah, so security reasons, I think, more than anything, and, and fire, a secondary reason. Who were the engineers? Oh, um, it was a New York firm, and the other name, Col Colby, was one. These were the same people that worked on the Mackinac, but they were interested in this venture long before 57. Uh, incidentally, I've now found, I'll come back to that, uh, I've now found a newspaper clipping Sioux Star June 1660, the time that the Sioux Ferries changed hands. Ownership of the International uh, Transit Company, which uh, operates the ferry service across the river, passed officially to the Ontario government. June the 16th, 1960. I wonder if there was a loss on that. Oh, it's the, the, it's the funds that you're On the debit side, they would buy the franchise. On the credit side, they would likely sell the ferry. Well, it was something like uh, $625,000. Uh, it seems to me there was some added amount that uh, sent those costs up, but the final price was higher than that. Uh, financial House directed me bond sales told the star that orders are in covering the entire eight million four hundred thousand dollar bond issue. That was the initial bond issue, and I think that was for um, simply the approaches. The province of Ontario already had agreed to buy seven million eight hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of Series B bonds. The remainder of the financing is covered by the building of three and a quarter million dollar United States approaches by the United States Bureau of Roads in the state of Michigan. Mr. Hanauer said that institutions who helped finance the $100 million, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yes, $100 million Mackinac break uh, were especially interested in the Sioux project. He said that as the only Michigan agent in the financing plan, the firm was made to fill the demand for bonds. We couldn't have begun to fill the institutional order, he remarked. The bonds were offered only last Thursday, and their speedy sale was evidence of the interest of the United States financial interest. So by private enterprise uh, operating, they were quickly uh, disposed of on the market in the United States. It was a bond seller, and this is what sparked the actual uh, beginnings of the, of the operation, because this gave them a measure of optimism in regard to it. On the bridge, there has only been one serious accident when a small foreign car uh, flipped over on the Canadian side. No one was hurt. May 1963 was the dedication. Insurance was placed through an American firm, um, but in 68, it was put up for bid again. Um, the main duty is to collect revenue so that the bond issues may be retired as outlined uh, as quickly as possible. If more money is available, three options are available. Reduced toll rates. 
retire the bonds at a faster rate so that tolls will be eliminated at an earlier date, improve the bridge facilities. Decision to be made by members of the bridge authority. I'm still looking for that point about the sellout. 